So let's pray as we open the word of God. Father, I just pray that as we open the word of God, that you would show us things that you need us to see. Lord, the word of God is, is a way that we come to know you more and glory in who you are and your presence it is also a way that we learn what you're calling us to in further and further obedience. And it's a way that we learn to trust you. It's a way that we find strength in you. And I pray we would have all of that today, Lord, as we deal with a fallen and broken world in the joy that we have in the living hope that you've given us. We love you, Lord. Forgive our sins. Let's be right before you as we come before you to have the honor of studying your word in your name. Amen. All right. So people um, who run a lot, they tend to like running. They get the so-called runner's high. You've heard of this, the runner's high. I have no clue. I have no clue what a runner's high is or even supposed to be. Sounds like a conspiracy by Nike and Reebok to get people to buy running shoes and clothes, which I sometimes like running clothes just to wear, you know, to sit around because they're comfortable, um, but not to run in. I can tell you the only thing I have experienced when running is what I would call the runner's low. Um, <laughs> It involves listening to myself breathe really, really hard and feeling a lot of aches and pains. And so there's nothing high about it. It is definitely a low, uh, but I have run a decent amount of my life, believe it or not. Um, clearly not lately. Um, but, you know, when I was young, I'd run to get in shape to play football or baseball. Uh, when, when I've been older, I have run to get in shape to lose weight. Uh, but not ever for me to get a runner's high. Be great. But maybe that would make me want to run, but I don't want to run. The idea of running for the sake of running, not a thing that I'm interested in at this point of life or have ever been interested in running just for the sake of running. Um, I go through the pain for a goal. For a goal. And do not doubt that it is very painful to run and to run hard. But the goal may be worth it, right? Generally, that goal is about being healthier. It could be about you know, getting in shape, uh, you know, sports teams or whatever, the Washington Huskies, as you know, are playing in the national championship tomorrow, 4.30 our time. Don't miss it. It's gonna be something special, we hope. We should have prayed for that in the praying to know we didn't. It's just a game with a bunch of boys throwing a ball around. But, but they run a lot to be ready for that game, right? Um, it's, it's a goal that they have. Uh, the trial that they go through in doing it is something uh, that they do because of what they're looking forward to, what they are going to experience, right? Running is also a good test to see what kind of, a sh what kind of shape, physical shape, you are in. All it takes is like the dog gets off the leash and you have to chase him or your plane is late and you got to run to catch the plane, or some other reason that you're running when you weren't planning to be running. And the first thing many of us say when we stop is, I'm so out of shape, right? That's what we say. It's the test. Are you in shape? Well, then you wouldn't have felt it when you had to run four steps to get your dog. But when you're on the ground, arms breathing, you know, I'm out of shape. The real test for being in shape is how far can you run without dying? Um, not very long for me. That's just, I don't know how far I can run by right now, but I know however far I could run, it would prove that I was not in shape. The test, I would fail. Um, there's a reason that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul in writing scripture <coughs> to use the metaphor of running, to describe running the race as a way to describe the call of a Christ follower. So we look at 2 Timothy 4. And we have Paul writing to Timothy. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So we see the Apostle Paul writing this. There are at least two things that Paul mentions here that are related to his running, that are reasons for his running. The first is that he finished the race and kept the faith. That's the first thing that he mentions. In other words, Paul's running, doing the hard thing, breathing hard, working hard, aches and pains and sorrow, 
Those were a proof of the genuineness of his faith. Okay, they were proof of the genuineness of his faith. How do we know that Paul had faith? We look at the way he ran. We look at the way he lived. We look at the way he faced trials. And that is a proof that we can all see of his faith. The other thing that Paul mentions is is here at the end. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So this is the second thing, and this is the first thing. Oh, that's not a pretty one. There you go. Okay? There's a real prize that Paul is running for, that he's looking forward to, that kept him running, right? He had a real prize that kept him in the race. He did not quit because he was looking forward to the living hope he had in Jesus Christ. The living hope he had in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Paul does not say, you will not find it where he says, I had a pleasant walk through the tulips. Looking forward to the crown. He does not talk about the nap he took to win the prize in Christ. You don't find that. He talks about the trial of running. Also fighting, right? Fighting the good fight. That's what he talks about. To prove his faith, right? And because of the crown he would receive on that day. So those are the two things that we hear. One, proof of faith. And two, the crown or the prize in Christ. That's what we see. We see Paul talking about, when we talk about running a race, Anyone who's run a race knows it's painful, it's hard, it hurts. You're pushing, you're pushing, you're trying to get to the end of that thing. And Paul, at this point in his life, his life is basically over. He knows as he's writing to Timothy, I'm at the end. I'm at the end. I've gotten to the finish line of this race. And I worked hard and it's done two things. It's proven my faith. I've kept the faith. And it has been a thing that I've looked forward to that is that is caused me to be able to continue to run. So that's what we have. We're continuing First Peter, and the Holy Spirit has inspired Peter, the apostle, to write the words of Scripture here that encourage us to do the same thing that Paul had done, to run. Okay? Last time that we were in um, Peter, a couple weeks ago, for Christmas, I guess, we studied sort of the living hope, not sort of the living hope, the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the imperishable gift that is already there for us in heaven in Jesus Christ, and that we're looking forward to that. So let's read verses three through five again from last time, okay? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten, right? This word we talked about, uh, born again, right? That's the same um, kind of word there. Us again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we have this living hope because of Christ's resurrection. And that's what's in us. That's what is pushing us to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. And that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Kept by the power of God, not by your own power. Through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So we have this idea that we have this living hope and that living hope through the resurrection, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is an imperishable thing that's there, that's waiting for us. Cannot be taken away. Everything else in life that you have can go away. Even these plastic bottles, which they tell us last a billion, million years. Right, I'm I'm sure that's not true. None of them are that old. They don't know that. Everything fades away. Doesn't matter what it is. Everything fades away, but not this. What you have in Christ is eternal and can never fade away. That is your living hope, right? And so that's where we were. We had that going on. And then we moved into the next thing. It says, in this. Well, what's in this? In this is in this stuff, right? Blessed be God the Father because of this living hope, this incorruptible thing. In this, you greatly rejoice. Well, I hope so. I hope that you greatly rejoice about that which God has for you, which is imperishable. Though now for a time, so this though does a lot of work. You rejoice even though, even though what? 
even though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So I'm rejoicing because of all the, all the stuff that you just said about this living hope, about all that. That's all there. And, and still, even still, we're dealing with trials that have grieved us. The churches that Peter is writing to are experiencing trials. They are sorrowful. Okay? And what does he say? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, the perish as though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, on that day that Paul was talking about, on that day at the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? Whom having not seen, you love. You love Jesus, even though you have not seen him. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So that's that next piece that we're going to look at. That scripture there. And he's writing these churches, and they're going through it. They're experiencing trials, and they are sorrowful. Undoubtedly, they're sorrowful. And this is important to me that you understand something. The scripture does not say that you are never to be grieved, that you are never to be sorrowful. The scripture tells us that they are grieved because trials grieve us. If I tell you to go outside, everybody, let's all go outside, and we're going to run a hard mile, okay? We're going to run a hard mile. I'm not going to tell you to not feel the pain because for most of us, it would be painful. Some of you probably are in great shape. Congratulations. Good for you. (laughs) The rest of us are going to feel the pain. Pain is the consequence of trials. We understand that. So they are grieving because they are facing real trials. The Bible says, you have been grieved. That's what we just read. Okay, that means made sorrowful, sadness, difficulty. That is, that is an experience that people have because of various trials. And we go through various trials. You go through certain ones. I go through certain ones. They're different, various trials. So I am not telling you, and you will not hear from me, not to be sorrowful when you go through trouble. You will be sorrowful. In fact, the one we follow also has been. Let's look at Matthew 26, 37 through 39, it says, and he took with him, this is Jesus, took with him Peter, which is kind of important because that's who wrote the letter we're studying, and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and he began to be sorrowful. Same word, same word that we just got right here. The Greek word here is the same word, sorrowful, okay? He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. This is a a more intense version of that Greek word. I am exceedingly, the idea is sorrowful unto death, which is what it says, exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus always being submissive to the father, going through a trial none of us have ever faced, taking on the sin of the world, being beaten, treated horribly and dying when you were sinless because of the joy that was set before him, which is you and me, that we could be saved, right? That's Jesus. Jesus experienced sorrow. He was a man of sorrows. Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected by men. This is, this is a prophecy about Jesus. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. So Jesus is fully acquainted with grief Many sorrows that he experienced while he was in this fallen world. Being sorrowful in trials is not sinful. Jesus Christ was sorrowful and he was completely without sin. The Greek word, as I said, is the same in both of those. Lupeo. Um, Not that you need to know that. And when Jesus says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. And Peter, who is writing the book, 1 Peter, that we are studying by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, heard Jesus say, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. He knew that Jesus experienced that. So as he's writing here and saying, you are being grieved by trials, he understands that that in and of itself is not a bad thing. 
It's a normal thing for us to experience. He knows that we will experience it as Christ followers because the one we follow, Jesus Christ, experienced it. So don't let anyone tell you that Christ followers are never supposed to be sorrowful. I can't stand that sort of self-help message. Like if you just take the right attitude towards it, everything is real. No, there are, there's a time to grieve. There's real sorrow in life. So we're told, we're told to rejoice with those who rejoice in what? Mourn with those who mourn, right? Because people do experience it. And it's not bad that they experience it. It is part of being in the fallen world. It's what draws us to the living hope is that we do experience sorrow. Amen. You will almost certainly face trials. If you're going to live more than a few minutes here, you're going to probably face some trials. The pastor that I used to have said, you're either going into one, you're in one right now, or you're coming out of one, right? That generally is the experience of life. So that's your one of those spots. You will experience, almost certainly, sorrowfulness. You will grieve in this fallen world. But knowing that Jesus grieved too helps me. I hope it helps you. But before it mentions the trials and the suffering, as we saw in the scripture, it says, in this you greatly rejoice. Talking about the living hope and so on. So we've got these two things sort of working with one another. We're greatly rejoicing even in sorrows. Even when we face trials that cause sorrow. So we're rejoicing and feeling sorrow. Now that's a little more complicated. If you want to know at least some experience of that or how that sort of can feel for people, ask any woman who's given birth, right? You're talking about an experience that has an awful lot of pain and yet an awful lot of joy in that same experience happening at the same time. I can't imagine the amount of pain. You ladies can talk to Eve about that. That's not, I didn't do that to you. Um, that was not God's original design, was that it was to be painful like that, but it is extremely painful, and yet there's this joy in this child that you're bringing into the world that you love as a mother, right? So they're both happening at the same time. So there is, a, there is at least some experiences that we have of both at the same time. We can rejoice and feel sorrow. The scripture tells us in this passage we just read, though now you do not see in believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible, with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving in the end of your faith the salvation of your souls. We are looking to that hope, the receiving of salvation, right? That's what we're looking to, being saved from our sins, no longer being part of the death of this broken world. We run. We run looking forward to that. Okay? And as we look forward to that, man, there's this inexpressible joy that's in us. Meanwhile, the running hurts. The running hurts. Cramps happen, right? And we grab our side and we keep putting our feet down on that pavement. And we keep running. We keep running even though we face trials. We set our face toward heaven and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we keep moving, experiencing at the same time as all that pain, a joy we can't even express while experiencing sorrow sometimes. Now, the truth is, we don't experience sorrow all the time. Sometimes the run can be lots of fun. In fact, most of us don't spend 90% of our time in sorrow. There are seasons where that might be true. But most of our life, if you look back and you take every minute of your life, and you're honest with yourself, most of your life is somewhere between neutral and pretty good. But there are some seasons of sorrow. There is that cramp that comes in, oh man, this is not easy to run and I want to stop. I want to stop running because it hurts. But we don't. We don't. The sorrow is temporary. The glorious hope of salvation is permanent. Amen. People go through all kinds of pain in this world. And they do it to chase after things that perish. Think about it. Think about it. I, I mean, when we do, when we work, people will be workaholics, just working themselves to the bone, missing out on all kinds of things so they can get some money. I don't know if you know this, but if, at least in my bank account, it never stays very long, right? It's, there's always something that it has to go to. It's perishable. The clothes I'm wearing are perishable. All these things that people work for in the world, they're willing to put in all kinds of pain for the perishable. What the Lord is saying is you will go through pain, but it's not for the perishable. It's for the imperishable. 
Right? You have this inheritance in heaven. He's gone to prepare a place for you. It's real. It's permanent. It will not perish. It will not pass away. And so our pain that we go through isn't like the pain that the world goes through, going through pain for nothing, nothing that lasts. We're going through the sorrow that comes with trials, looking forward to the imperishable. We also, just like Paul, are proving our faith as we run. Our faith is tested. Right? It's tested. So we read just in this passage today by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, as we sort of just talked about, though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Trials can be a test of our faithfulness, and they can build us up so that we can be more and more like Jesus. That's the reality. And we go, well, I don't like that. I don't care. <laughs> right? Like, I do care. I care about you, but this is what the Scripture says. And when the Scripture says, that something is good, even though it hurts, we have to believe that it is. That he will use, again, we have Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who are the called, right? That's the fact. So what do we see in James? This is James uh, 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Well, that's, uh, that's a pretty good thing to have, to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So maybe I can count it joy. Again here, we just got this trials and joy, joy and trials. Right? This word for trials, various trials, same word that we read in 1 Peter, okay? Same word that we read, uh, a Greek word, trials difficulties, these things that cause sorrow, these difficulties we go through, these various trials, that's what we go through with joy. We're supposed to be joyful this time, not just about what we're looking forward to, but about the trials themselves, says James, because they test our faith, which produces, which produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The testing brings us to perfection. That's what God is doing in us. He who begin a good work in you will be faithful to complete it, right? How does he do that? Partially through trials. You're going through something right now? It is something that you can be joyful that you're experiencing because of what you know it will produce in you. A trial will produce patience. It will produce patience. In fact, if you meet people that are patient, like you meet somebody, oftentimes this person is going to be not young, but older. And you say, man, this person just has so much patience. If you ask them, they're probably going to tell you about a whole lot of trials that produce that patience. They're unlikely to have found that patience without trials. Who is the least patient? Toddlers. So we produce some trials for them. You know, try to produce a little more patience in them. Um, you know, my parents produced plenty of trials for me, most of them on my backside, Right? Because it was like, nope, you're going to need to be a little more patient. Let me teach you a lesson. How about have some joy in this trial? Uh, but no, they didn't do a say it like that. But that's the fact, right? A, a, a toddler is the least patient, and the older you get, probably the more patient. What, the, there's one big difference between a toddler and a person that's older, and that is the number of trials they've gone through, the, the, time, of, the time they've been on the earth, the, the, what they've experienced, right? So a godly person who will have joy in their trials will have patience in their trials. Now, you can learn nothing from them. The unbeliever who doesn't understand anything spiritual can learn nothing from them, but the believer who goes through trials will produce patience, and that patience will have its perfect work making you perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's what it will do. The testing that brings us to perfection. All that sorrow leads to joy. And it's not just joy for us, but it's joy for those we minister to. You are being built up, not just for yourself, but to minister to others. And we've got to look at the way that we face trials. We have to analyze and assess ourselves. How are we facing trials? How is it going for us? What are we doing here? We can have sorrow, but we must not in that look like people who have no hope. 
We can't. We must not give up the living hope we have, and we must have the abiding joy that we are in Jesus Christ. We can trust him to fulfill all that he's promised to us. And if you have that and you hold on to that, even in the midst of your sorrow, real sorrow, real grief, you have that living hope. You don't sorrow like someone who has no hope. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this. Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you're disqualified. Now we who are in Christ are not disqualified. We are saved and we're faithful to him. That does not mean you never mess up, by the way. That's not the idea of testing yourself here. Test yourself because if you mess up at all, clearly you're not, no, that's not anything what is being said here. It means that when you do mess up, you confess and you repent and you turn to Jesus. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we know that. That verse wouldn't be there if we never sinned. Of course we sin. Read the rest of 1 John. You'll find out all about that. It does mean that we have to work to have joy in our trials, in the middle of our sorrows. It does mean that we look to our only hope, the living hope we have in Jesus Christ. That is but when you're assessing yourself, when you're testing yourself. I need to see that my faith is strong. Paul talks about it. Peter talks about it, right? This testing of your faith. I, I want my faith to be strong in the Lord. This is how you do it. It means that you keep running even when it hurts, even when we are breathing hard, even when the cramps happen and the aches and the pains set in. It means that we trust God 100%. That is the proof of our faith. When in the midst of all of that, you go, I trust him. Though he slay me, yet I trust him, Right? Whatever I go through, I trust him, I believe him. It would mean nothing to say I trust God when nothing bad ever happens. If you don't have to face trials and difficulties and trust him and love him and have joy in the midst of him, you don't have faith, you just have an easy life. Not the same thing. So we have these testings that come and they prove to ourselves, but not only to ourselves, but to everyone who is watching that we believe in Jesus Christ, that we love him, right? That we have joy, that we believe in that living hope, that we have eternal life. So when the person next to you at work or your family member who's an unbeliever and they see you go through something, or maybe you go through the same thing and you're both suffering and you have real sorrow, you're not playing it off like, I'm never sad, yay. You know, cheerleader style. <laughs> That's not... I'm not mad. If you're some of your cheerleaders, that's okay. You're okay. Not the guys. Um, that's weird to me. But if you have an attitude that where it can be, you can be sorrowful and joyful at the same time, that is something that is going to draw other people to believe in Jesus, period. Because that's not something the world has. What the world has when there are sorrows and troubles is addiction, Right? Alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever. It's looking to some way to, to cover the sorrow, to deal with the grief in a way that can make them forget about it. What we have as Christ followers is we experience the sorrow, and the way we deal with the sorrow is our joy in the living hope that we're looking forward to. As we're running, and it hurts, and we're doing the thing, we're looking at Jesus, right? And we're saying, I believe you, I trust you, and as we do that, we get stronger in our run, and the trials that we can face can be bigger and bigger and bigger because we trust the Lord. Meanwhile, we're proving our faith to ourselves and to those around us, and we're looking forward to the goal that we get from it. Right? Jesus Christ. He is what we get. Eternal life in him. It's the proof of our faith. And we should be proving our faith as a testimony to ourselves and to those around us that we are in Jesus Christ. I want the people around you to be like, you know, whatever anybody else says about religion, this person says they're in Jesus Christ and everything about them says to me, that seems to be true. This is the centurion saying, truly this was the son of God, right? Truly this is Jesus working in this person. It has to be real. How else could they face sorrow with such a strong face and still have joy in their life? And trust God when, I, when, I, when I'm done, I can't deal with it. And here they are showing that there's a strength inside them. The strength is the Holy Spirit 
who is really the one doing all this work to help us run in the first place. Being in Jesus Christ makes a difference. It should be obvious that it makes a difference to the world. The difference between you and an unbeliever is not that there are no trials and no sorrow. Anybody who tries to sell Christianity in that way, it's just what, what a waste of time. You know, come know Jesus and you'll never be sad again or sick or whatever. You'll be rich and you're, you know, this kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, I'm sure that people want to hear that. They're itching ears, but that's not what the scripture says. Paul did, like I said, Paul didn't talk about how he just tiptoed through the tulips. He talked about the race that he ran. And we know what that means. We know what fighting the good fight and running a race means. It means pain and yet joy. In the middle of our sorrows, we have a living hope. And because of that living hope, we have joy. So we will live in that joy. We will comfort each other in our trials and sorrows, and we will keep running the race. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the promises that you give us. And Lord, I pray that when we face trials, and we're not asking for them, but we know they're going to come, that we would have joy in them in every way that you've talked about here in your scripture. And we would have joy because we know, what we're, we know our future and your promises, and you are sure to do that which you have said you're going to do. We can trust that you will fulfill all that you have claimed, all that you have promised. We can have joy because we know that the trials that we go through produce patience and that patience will have its perfect work, making us complete and perfect. That you are making us new in you as you've said, that you who begin a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. And we thank you for the trials because they prove the genuineness of our faith, both to ourselves and to those around us. And so while we don't like trials, we don't think that they're fun because they're not, Lord, I pray that our sorrow would always be godly sorrow, meaning sorrow that leads back to joy and a sorrow that those from the outside can look at and they can say, I want to be able to when I have to sorrow to sorrow like that. I want to be able to when I go through trials to go through trials like that. I want Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we would be your witnesses Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, of your resurrection, the power of your resurrection because of how we face trials. Let your word be in us. Let your scripture change us and move us. In your name, amen.